There we go. Hey, everybody, welcome to Off Planet Radio, offplanetradio.com, Off Planet TV, or however media you're viewing us. Welcome to Ritual America. We are in the throes of a spasm, a spasm, I tell you, of just craziness, insanity, violence, and just deranged mentalities all over the landscape right now. And uh, we're going to talk about some things that are just, well, it'll, it'll rip your cerebral cortex open another three millimeters anyway. Em, <laughs> tell us about it. <laughs> hey, guys. Um, uh, before I introduce the guest, I just wanted to, A, thank the people who have already subs um, uh, subscribed on Patreon and are supporting us. We really appreciate it. We've had a really good response so far. And uh, we're hoping others will join us. There have been a few questions about things, so I just want to kind of explain to people real quickly how the levels work. Um, there's four, four, five, five levels, five levels. Um, no, yeah, was it five levels? Is it five levels? There's, <laughs> there's, sorry, there's a $3 level that is basically just kind of a, you know, uh, thank you for, you know, for, to, to us and will offer access to occasional um, blogs, essays, and, and um, eventually a newsletter from, uh, from us. Um, the $5 letter, uh, level gives you access to bonus uh, video content. First bonus video already went out the other day. $7 level gives you access to the, um, each, and each, with each level you get the previous rewards as well. So in addition to the two previous rewards, the $7 level gives you access to a monthly sort of group chat that we will do once a month for the people who are donating at that level or, ho or higher. Um, the $10 level gives you all of those things, plus a after six months of subscription, uh, a thumb drive with special collection of archived episodes of Off Planet Radio. And the uh, $20 level gives you all of the previous rewards, plus uh, after six months, a, a special piece of Off Planet mem memorabilia that will be designed by an artist that we have chosen. And yeah, so join in. And uh, thanks for those who are Yeah, well, well let, me, let me just chime in here because we have uh, basically four levels. The basics, $3, then we have the $5, $7, and $10. And then there's okay. actually a $20. So That's there's five, five I levels. Went, okay, I already did right. them all. I needed to get it clear in my head. It's five. I already went through. I, I wasn't sure for yet. It's five, it's five levels. I wasn't five paying levels. attention. Five levels, and so we're, you know, that's what we're doing for right now. We're, we're going to experiment with this for six months, and then we may do some rearranging of whatnot or whatnot. But that's what we're doing now. And so, uh, join us, please. Yeah, and, and there were there were apparently a, there's going to be some screw ups as we go through this because this is a different platform than what we've normally used, and so I'm still finding my way through the Patreon website and all the nuances of it so if anybody has any questions about it uh feel free to a email us and uh we'll straighten it out as we go along because like everything else it's 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 a learning process yeah be patient with us we're just we're just learning it as well so anyway all right so let's get to it man there is a lot going on and um we're gonna rip through a bunch of it tonight so uh we're gonna hit on Las Vegas, Tom Petty, Hugh Hefner, and the politicization of sports. And there's only one person we do that with, and you know who it is, Robert Phoenix. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio. It's always my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Welcome, Robert. Good yeah. to have you on. Always great to be back with you guys. Yeah, Robert and I got to hung in, we got to hang in Houston at the uh, Paracon conference a few weeks ago. And uh, that, was, that was a great time. Uh, I think given that it was the first year of the conference it was a it was a definite jumping off point for us but it was really nice to get to meet you robert and uh elizabeth your assistant and some of the other people that we got to gather with out there at the, at the hilton hotel yeah it was great you know um you know we just ran into each other sort of kismetically at breakfast yes we did you know, here you were, and I saw you sitting down. I'm like, oh, hey, Randy, you know, and, and we, we hooked we hooked up and connected. And then, then uh, I guess it was Saturday night. We kind of gathered around for a few cocktails. That was a lot of fun, too. Yeah. Uh, it, I just didn't get enough time to spend with you, to be honest with you, while, while we were there. I know we planned on doing a show and stuff, but I was, 
I was fried. My circuits were just fried by the time Sunday night came around. Yeah, those kind of events are definitely high intensity in terms of getting with people and talking, and it's impossible to cover all the bases, but uh, it was good meeting you. It was good meeting all of the other folks that I met out in Houston. Hi to some of you in Houston, because I know you're going to see this. Yeah. Okay, so are we, well, uh, Emily, we derailed you totally with our... Yeah. We're good. No, we're totally fine. I think we can just say, yeah, I did my thing. Everybody knows Robert's here. You two chatted. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, let's just jump right into it, man. Shit is crazy as you, you could possibly crazy. imagine. So let's uh, jump right in and start with what is going on in Las Vegas, Robert. Well, you know, I really think we have to go back to the eclipse. Yeah. Because, okay. I mean, there's like a, a pre-eclipse America and a post-eclipse America. Yeah. Yeah. And um, even pre-eclipse America was pretty weird, right? <laughs> but we haven't seen anything like this maybe ever. You know, we have the eclipse, um, pre-eclipse, you know, that eclipse period is about, you know, 13 days before the eclipse, about 13 days after. Of course, we have Charlottesville that takes place, you know, in the shadow of the eclipse. And everything that goes along with Charlottesville and all all the madness and all, you know, and all of a sudden that's just down the memory hole, right? Really quickly. Everything gets flushed really quickly, you know? Yeah. And so we go from that to, to Harvey, you know, Hurricane yeah. Harvey and everything that brought to Houston, which was real. I mean, it was really good that we were in a part of Houston that was high and dry, the west side of Houston. Uh, we had all these refugees from Harvey, many of whom were refugees from actually Katrina. You know, who are now in their their second kind of you know diaspora from you know their their original place and they were hanging out at our hotel and they had a bunch of people at our hotel who were working on clearing out the rubble you know interstate yeah. so we saw what was what was going on at least from our kind of perspective and Harvey was you know for for the most part in terms of its damage in terms of what it did it was quite real you know how how it actually occurred of course, we could spend probably the whole night talking about that. Um, and then, of course, we had Irma on the on the heels of Harvey. And then we had this whole thing with the NFL and Trump dropping bombs down in um, uh, Alabama, Arkansas, with Jeff Sessions and, you know, trying to fill his seat with Luther Strange. And all of a sudden, the NFL decides they're going to take on Trump. And, you know, classic Trump move to throw the bomb into the room, grenade in the room, see what happens. Then we have this whole thing going on now between the left and the right. And, you know, now it's unfortunately become incredibly racial, you know, this whole kind of black white duality piece, which is really unfortunate is being played out. And to be honest with you, you know, both sides are kind of playing out to some degree, one side, maybe a little bit more than other at times, but it's almost like we're being forced to choose sides, which is kind of, you know, kind of messed up. I'll be honest. Yeah. Um, and, and so then now after that, what do we have now we've got, Las Vegas on the heels of the NFL stuff. So it's almost like every week now we're being shot through this cyclotron of events, experience, and, um, you know, being sort of tossed about in the, you know, the human salad bowl. It's, it's a very intense time we're living in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is, it's to it is chaos. I mean, this is like, I mean, I've been feeling a lot of chaos for all summer and in, and to, to now, but it certainly has ramped up and picked up. And it's it is crazy how many things come up. And then the next week they seem like they're like a major major thing. And then the next week just onto something else and onto something else. And every week there's a most serious thing that ever happened happening. Doesn't you know? it doesn't it feel like you're kind of a passenger on a bullet train now, watching events go by very rapidly in the window? Are we yes. really in this, or are we observers in it? Because more and more. I'm feeling incredibly distanced by the whole yeah. milieu. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's a whole level of detachment that's taking place. You know, and you, we talked about this before we, you know, yeah. came on live, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, this whole thing with, with, with Las Vegas, it's like, here we go. You know, we're, go we're supposed to get ramped up emotionally and buy into this. And, you know, there's a really good chance, you know, that there were people that actually got killed there yeah. and hurt there. I mean, you know, of course they had the crisis actor thing going on before all of this, putting the seed of doubt in our heads. 
So we don't really know now when something is a real false flag, whether it's a psychological operation, whether it's a hybrid event. Yeah. You know? So we don't, we can't really like pin these things down. And, uh, you know, before the show, you know, we're there, we were talking with somebody who knows a sound guy for Jason Aldean's group who was there and there were clearly three shooters that were identified, three shooters, not just Stephen Paddock, who, who we'll talk about, but three shooters. And of course, there's this, you know, kind of, again, and we'll get into the astrologists because there's a lot of really, I did the chart for the event. There's a lot of really interesting astrology for it. Um, the whole, the whole premise of this event, and you'll, you'll be blown away by some of these echoes when I bring them up, is that it's there to continue to widen the gap between people. And, and you know, this is like, you know, like a vice grip, you know, how it goes, it, 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 they're just going counterclockwise. And this thing's going like this now, right? Yeah. This country was, used to be kind of like this, this event's moving us further and further apart. And even sort of the psychic disjunction of the whole thing. So if you look at it, who are the people being fired upon? They're conservative, they're Trumpians, country Western people, Generally speaking, that's the demographic. And then you've got this guy who's firing on them, and he's not ethnic, he's not Muslim, although there are people that would love to say that he's actually a Muslim. I don't believe that. Um, so what you have is you have, in my estimation, a patsy. And yeah. to what level he's a patsy, we'll try to uncover and unravel. But here's he fits this. He's a lone wolf. He's somebody who snapped. He's 63 years old. He's a lone gunman. He's a this lone is... gunman. He's a white guy, right? He's white. Yeah. So it fits this, you know, the white devil with the gun in the tower. But it doesn't make sense because he's like shooting a mostly white crowd. Right. right. Yeah. So this is where there's cognitive dissonance is coming in. Now, we have to ask ourselves, um, is this pre-planned? Is this meant to kind of, you know, mess with us? Or are they just getting sloppy with this whole thing? You know, so this is part of the, this is the first kind of level that we have to kind of, you know, initiate ourselves or, or move into the event with, is that on a surface level, it makes no sense. And yet you have the left who's really wanting to politicize this you know, in terms of their gun grab. And I mean, it's really horrific to be honest with you. Yeah. But then you have people on the right who are willing to politicize this as well. And all the, you know, like I watch Alex Jones just to see what's happening and you know, try to, you know, filter out what he's talking about. Most of which is neocon propaganda, by the way. Yep. And um, here he is, he's selling the shooter. Uh, he, he, you know, yesterday when he was doing his live show, he was talking to Paul Joseph Watson and he said, Paul, I just got a live. I got a. I got, I got a live piece here. I have to bring in, and he starts to look at his cell phone, and he says that 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 it, the FBI went into the room. It's the FBI. Remember that it's the FBI. It went into the room. It was a hostage rescue thing, hostage hostage rescue operation, and they they took the guy out. And by the way, on today's show, he actually showed a graphic of what we would think was Stephen Paddock's. Head. Did you guys catch that? At Antifa rally, at an Antifa rally? No, no. Oh. This was the guy that got killed. Right. No, but he had. I saw. I, I just when I was scrolling through my YouTube feed today, the picture that was on for one of the videos. I didn't look at it. Said that that uh, they were starting to say that Stephen Paddock had had been caught at some point at an Antifa rally, and it looked like they was trying to compare a picture from Antifa rally to that. So I thought that's what you were talking about. No, Sorry. he showed he showed a picture of Stephen Haddock's head blown off today. Oh. I mean, he was missing a portion of his skull. Oh. I mean, it was right there. It was so totally graphic and horrific. Yeah. And I couldn't believe that this was being shown. I mean, this was kind of like an Abu Ghraib moment. Yeah. It's traumatizing, right? It's traumatizing and triggering. Now, what's really interesting, though, is astrologically, and I know this because I paid $3.95 to get Stephen... Um, Paddock's Intellis report, which has his birthday. And he's an Aries. He was born in April, 1953. So he's an Aries. And Aries, of course, have to deal with gunshots, head wounds, 
you know, that's a Aries kind of typical sort of malady. Aries rules the head and violence. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, that's interesting. At the very least, this picture is, you know, confirming that Stephen Paddock, you know, fits a classic kind of, he wasn't shot in the heart, wasn't shot, you know, in the chest. He had a massive wound in the head. But what Alex Jones is trying to do is he's trying to link Stephen Paddock up with Antifa yeah, and, and also ISIS. Yeah. And now the whole narrative is that there, there are Antifa training with ISIS warriors. Right. Going, they're going, apparently they're going to Syria. This is the narrative now. They're going to Syria to be trained by the Kurds. So Alex Jones is now linking Stephen Paddock, Antifa, and ISIS, ISIS. Yeah. and the new Kurdish Revolution Rebellion, which was set up by our good friends in the Middle East. We all know who they are. <laughs> and they can't get their hooks out of Syria. They just can't get their hooks out of Syria. You know, they, want to, they basically want to turn Syria into this training den or zone yeah. of the Antifa. And so they're trying very, very, you know, very hard. They're, they're putting a lot of muscle into this to connect this Stephen Paddock guy up with that. You know, he's a 63 year old dude. And, you know, he's, he's, he has a house in Mesquite. He also has a house apparently in Nevada, Reno. And there's another paddock that's on that, on the lease or the, uh, the, the, the uh, escrow of that house, the role of that house. I don't know who she is. It could be a sister, it could be an ex-wife. I don't know, but there's another paddock in, in Reno, Nevada. So um, it's, then Alex will, he'll go through this. And he'll make, he'll make all these wild assertions and claims. And then he'll say, well, he really just could be a cutout. We don't right. know. Right. But he just spent like five minutes breaking everything down. And then he says, well, he really just could be a cutout. Right. So, so it's like 90% making a case that Stephen Paddock was deep in the thrall of Antifa. Right. What, you know, and then maybe about, you know, 5% that, oh, so has Alex moved from the spot of, you know, if we're acting on the assumption that which we have to at this point, that he is on some level, obviously a disinformation agent. Has he moved from that space where he had to tell 90% truth to be able to get away with the 10% misinformation he was going to put in there to a space where he has such a large platform now and we're in such a weird polarized place that he can now present 90% bullshit and just 10% truth. Yeah. I think that's kind of where it's at. And you know, you know, he says ISIS did it, ISIS, ISIS, ISIS. ISIS was the creation of right. the United States. And Israel. Israel, Turkey, yeah. Yeah. MI6, and Saudi Arabia, and to some extent, whatever kind of human discharge came out of Libya, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that's who ISIS is. So if he says that he's connected to ISIS, well, he's connected to those countries right. that actually created ISIS. Right. So we have to understand this whole ISIS piece. It's a total misnomer. And they're, and they're getting their asses kicked. Yeah. And, now, and now what they've done is they've, they've had this separatist Kurdish movement. Yeah. And they, they're, they're training the Kurds. They're giving the Kurds weapons. And, uh, you know, the Kurds now are this kind of proxy army, even though, you know, Alex Jones is saying that the Kurds are training Antifa, the Kurds better watch their ass. Because they can get, you know, backdoored real easy by the people that are promising them all these weapons and all totally. this training and a little bit of real estate in southern Turkey. They better watch out because totally. you can't trust these people. You can't trust them. Yeah. So the event itself, if you want to get into the astrology event, you want to do that? Let's let, yeah, let's do that. Very interesting. All right. So the moment that we become aware of it is when Jason Aldean is on stage and and uh, you can see him he's playing his music is this i've never heard of this person before is he a country music star yeah, is he's pretty popular actually okay so it's a sunday night it's the last night of the festival and he's he's one of, he's going to be a headliner and i don't know if there was somebody else that was going to perform after him but it's late at night and uh, probably the final act of the festival itself which had been happening for three days and, and, and you have to ask yourself if Stephen Paddock really blew a fuse and he became the lone gunman 
or Stephen Paddock, you know, all, all the Antifa drugs started kicking in and he just wanted to start taking people. Why didn't he just do it on Friday night? Right. You know, why didn't he do it on set? Why didn't he wait for the last night of the festival? Well, you'd also, you would think that Saturday night would be the biggest night. The, the most people would be there. So you'd think that, huge draw. Yeah. Huge draw. So why did he wait till Sunday? Do you want to like enter in some poker tournament or something before he took a bunch of people out? The guy was a big gambler. You like, yeah. you know, his father was uh, a bank yeah. robber. Right? Yeah. And FBI weird. 10 most wanted list, right? That's totally weird. So there's totally. a lot of high strange coming, coming through in this thing. O.J. Simpson was OJ, yeah. released the night before. Yeah, so like that. So if we're looking at this as some kind of ritual event, that could certainly have been part of it. Uh, you know, we're, oh, we're abs to... absolutely. I got a, I got a really interesting story about O.J. too. Do you want to hear it? Please. <laughs> we're going to go back in time a little bit. All right. And this has to do with um, I was I was part of this like psychedelic group, right? So we were like journey and tripping this back in the nineties. And I was at this little pot lucky thing. And this guy uh, called us over. He said, you know what? I want to tell you a story. So what is it? He said, well, I have a friend of a friend. And she was driving down I-5, which is in California. Everybody knows I-5. And this light came out of the sky. It, was, it wasn't the sun. It was a blinding light. Mm -hmm. Out of this light, an angel appeared. And the angel said, uh, in in 14 days, the first trumpet will sound. And so she was like waving, you know, kind of moving along the side of the road and kind of had to pull over. And there was a highway patrolman and he pulled her over and, and he asked her what was going on. And she told him the story. And he said, you're the fifth person that told me that story today. Wow. So I'm like, wow, this is, this is really interesting. Right. So I, in, in, in my head, I was like doing the math on the days. And do um, you know what happened on the day that this angel said the first trumpet would sound? It was, it was the day that O.J. Simpson and Al Cowlings were chased down the freeway. Right. In their what? White Bronco. Bronco, yeah. Old, a pale horse. Yeah, right? okay. Oh, this is perfect because I'm going to pull something about that into this too. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm thinking, holy shit, you know, there's, there's, there's something going on here in, in a big way. Yeah. All our attention is drawn to this. And where did, where did he live? He lived what in, on Rockingham? Right, on Rockingham and Brentwood. Rockingham, right. yeah. Rockingham right. Court and Brentwood. Right, Rockingham. But there isn't there, where, where does Los Cielo come into this? There's an address called Los Cielo. Is it where, um, Nicole was living. No, she she lived on Bundy, and Bundy. before that, she lived on Gretna Green. I, okay. I I'm not sure what Los Cielo is. Uh, anyway, so he comes. Okay, so this happens. This happens pretty much right to the day that this thing happens to this woman on the I five. So it's it's the white Bronco, behold the pale horse. And what's really interesting too is I've been watching this movie called The Rapture. And it's with Mimi Rogers, mm -hmm. right? Have you seen this movie? No, but she is a very interesting person. It's with Mimi Rogers and David Duchovny. Oh, Mimi Rogers is a Scientologist. David Duchovny is a sex addict. And, and, yeah. he, and, 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 right? and, he, and, and he wants to believe. So there you go. So in this movie, there's this really interesting scene at the end of the film where uh, I don't want to blow this movie because it's actually worth seeing. And there's a scene at the end of the movie where she's in a jail somewhere out in the desert in California. And the rapture happens and there are TVs on inside the jail. And the team that there's actually a football game playing at that, at that time when the rapture happens. And it's the USC Trojans, which right. is OJ Simpson's OJ's team. team. And yeah. the guy comes out and he's riding this white horse and he blows it's Gabriel, right? He blows the horn. Wow. So I'm thinking, wow, this is really interesting. Was that really the first trumpet of the apocalypse when O.J. Well, Simpson? Quite possibly. Uh, not so, uh, the show before last, our guest Danny Katz was talking about how that the O.J. Simpson uh, case was considered the beginning of the fall of journalism. That was when the fourth estate fell, was yeah. with the O.J. Simpson. 
So yeah, like for, in order for all the stuff that's been happening now to happen, we had to have an unfunctional media. And, and that was the case that brought us unfunctional media. You know what I mean? And yep. or dysfunctional media. And so interesting. Yeah, that could be the first trumpet blast for sure. And also in a weird way, the OJ Simpson trial is kind of the birth of the Kardashians. Yep. Because Bobby Kardashian. But also the Bruce Jenner thing that brought Bruce Jenner back to our attention, you know, for his role that he was going to be playing. You know yep. what I mean? So and yeah. And OJ actually betrayed Bobby Kardashian by having an affair with Chris. Yeah. So it all, it all sort of comes full circle. But let's get back to you. Las Vegas. Which is real interesting, I think. So this, so 940 at night is when everything starts to go off the rails. Okay. And when you look at the chart, the one thing that really grabs my attention of the chart is the rising sign at the moment. And it's Gemini. Mm. 14 degrees, right? So what do we know about Gemini? It's all about duality. And what have we been in? I mean, we've been in this massive duality operation yeah it's all part of the alinsky model polarize freeze all that stuff and this is what the alinsky acolytes have been have been doing and even their proponents on the right yeah. you know many of whom have gone through skull and bones where they understand this whole thing around duality and all working yeah. for this higher cause and the resolution of duality but only on their terms where they're the gods right yeah. that's how it works so we have Gemini rising, duality, splitting people apart, left and right, and the whole mind fuck, which is the old white guy shooting at mostly white people. I mean, that's just a cognitive dissonance, you know, candy bar right there. But what's really interesting about this degree of the ascendant, 14 degrees Gemini, I looked this up, when 9-11 happens, on 9-11-2001, Saturn was in Gemini. Where was Saturn? Saturn 14, was at 14, 14 degrees. Gemini. Here we go, right? So now we're starting to move the wheels on this new kind of 9-11 moment in our history. Look at where the sun is at that time. The sun is at nine degrees Libra, 11 minutes. Wow. Nine. And wasn't this the Route 91 Harvest Festival too? Route 91, and it was on 10-1. Right. So it's not quite 9-11. Right. got some ones in there, but it is harvest. What kind of harvest are we talking about? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, wow. So, that, another, so that's just for starters. Yeah. Um, the oh, by the way, let's not forget... October 1st is the 274th day of the year. There are 91 days left in the year. Brilliant. So, yeah, very brilliant. good. Oh, so, okay. I'm going to jump around a little bit. But since you brought up the day, that's, a, that's an amazing fact, Brandy. But I, wanna, I, wanna, I looked into history to figure out or find out what some of the sort of keynote days that take place on October 1st. Mm. Some of these days are gonna blow you away. You ready? Yeah. Okay. In 331 BC, Alexander the Great defeated Darius III of Persia. That's a huge battle in history, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is. This is when the Zoroastrians go down and Alexander takes possession, begins to take possession of the, of the Levant. Um, in 1553, Queen Mary I of England is coronated. Uh, in 1795, the Austrian Netherlands, present-day Belgium, are annexed by revolutionary France. In 1800, Spain cedes Louisiana to France via the Third Treaty of San Ildefonso. In 1814, the opening of the Congress of, of Vienna intended to redraw Europe's political map after the defeat of Napoleon. Okay, that's a huge one. In uh, 1827, the Russo-Persian War, uh, the Russian army under Ivan Paskevich storms your vein, ending a millennium of Muslim domination of Armenia. In 1891, Stanford University opens its, opens its doors. In 1908, 
Ford puts the Model T car on the market. This is all October 1st, 1918, World War One. Arab forces under T.E. Lawrence, also known as Lawrence of Arabia, captured Damascus. October 1st, Francisco Franco named head of the nationalist government in Spain. 1946, Nazi leaders are sentenced at the Nuremberg trials. 1949, the People's Republic of China is established and declared by Mao Zedong on October 1st. Here's some more. Uh, the free speech movement is initiated and launched on the campus of Berkeley in 1964. So there's some pretty radical That's, elements, right? Yeah, that last one right there is a big one. That's a oh, big one. I'm going to add a couple more layers. All right. 1971, Walt Disney World opens. Oh, Jesus. How about it's, that? Well, and Las Vegas is like Walt Disney World for adults, so for sure. Go on. Absolutely. In 1971, this is on the technical side. The first brain scan using an X-ray computed uh, tomography was performed at Atkinson Morley Hospital. It looked like this, Wimbledon. <laughs> okay, no, uh, Wimbledon part aside, no accident there. When, uh, when I unpack what I think is going on here later, no accident there. Okay, go on. Uh, the United States lovingly returned sovereignty of the Panama Canal to Panama, October 1st. Ah. 1982, Epcot opens on October 1st. That's, that's the plan, the future planned city, right? right. Okay. Exactly. Um, in 1989, Denmark introduces the world's first legal modern same-sex union. Oh, God. Registered <laughs> partnership. It's just, okay, it's just crazy. I mean, look, we can just like check the boxes, right? We've got okay. Disney. Yep. We're sentencing Nazis. We're, you know, uh, Basically, uh, China becomes a, a communist republic. It's crazy. Okay, there's more. <laughs> there's more. You ready? In 2015, there is a shooting at Umpqua Community College. Right. In Roseburg, Oregon, which was a total fake. The false stabbing, right? The fake, the fake the stabbing or whatever? Theater. Yeah. Yeah. So this day itself, October 1st, is chock full of really interesting historical events wow. that just check all those really high strange boxes. Mind control, Disney, yep. China, the dominance of China, same-sex marriage, brain scans. It's all in there. Henry Ford. It's all in there. Everything. I mean, what a every day, huh? Okay, that's crazy. All right, so you want, let me I – have, I have like – a bunch of thoughts on this whole thing. I'm trying to decide if I want to like go do the sort of event I, the event unpack first or the esoteric unpack. But let's start with the event unpack. So I didn't take much of a look at this. Um, instinctively, I understood somehow what was going on, and I've heard a little bit. I've seen a very few videos, but this is what I see just from the outside. And maybe this might make sense of some of the things we think don't make sense. Okay, so I see it as. So, some kind of mercenary team, some kind of mercenary team, a sniper team went in there and did this. And I was thinking of the Stephen Paddock guy as the mind controlled patsy, right? Um, the, on the only other option I see that, other than him being a mind controlled patsy is whether, you know, he was into gambling. If this was an event that was partially coordinated by the mob and he owed somebody money, then he may have been willing to that, play. That's one of the theories now that's circulating the internet. Yeah. Okay. So there's that. But the, um, the, the whole point of this being basically two things, okay? So um, you, they're really interested in increasing the surveillance state right now. And this guy know. obviously got into the hotel with all of these weapons. And we know that when the Ariana Grande thing happened, now all of the concert places like Hollywood Bowl and even places that have never had a metal detectors or scanning or anything before, they all have that now. They have metal detectors. They want to start doing, they probably want to start doing TSA style x-rays and scanning. Biometrics, biometric scanning. Biometric yeah. scanning, all that kind of stuff. And so they want to introduce that because they want, you know, we would have seen his guns coming in if he had to go through a metal detector. Also, right. you could take it to the further, the biometrics or, or even, you know, picturing someone's brain to see what mental their condition they're in before they're allowed to have a good time or whatever. They have that technology. Right. Okay. So that, and then why would he shoot at, why would the 64-year-old white man shoot at the, the country and Western uh, people, right? 
Well, yeah. these are people who are supposedly Trump supporters, and these Trump supporters or these right-wingers or these white people who like guns, whenever any of these other shootings happen, they're, all, they're, they're not swayed by it. But if maybe there was a shooting done to them, then suddenly they would go, well, maybe, maybe the guns are not such a good idea. Maybe we do need to have further restriction on guns, right? So that, that, kind, of, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing uh, would be the only explanation. You know, that's the, you know, that's, that would be why they would choose to have a white man shoot at white people. Well, I, th I think what they would do is they, they would get people that are kind of on the fringe and barely hanging on to the Trump train. Yeah. But, but what, what I've seen happening with people – is that we're just so diametrically imposed and entrenched and nobody can have a dialogue anymore. So they could, just like when Hillary Clinton was running for president, I mean, she could be eating, you know, we talked about this, an embryo, you know, on stage. And, <laughs> and her supporters would say, you know, oh, hey, that's great. She's into birth control, right? Right. Uh, yeah. And the same, oh. the same thing could be said from the Trump side. Yeah. It would be like, we don't care. We don't care how many people die as long as we get to keep our guns. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, I think that that's kind of where we are at this point. You may get a few people hanging on the fringe. A, a few people, but I think it also makes all the people who have tolerated their friends who are Trump supporters now makes them more aggressively uh, Oh, they're, yeah. They're, angry. they're, so, they're in the so, archipelago now, right? So that's this, this hits, this fulfills several different agendas. You know what I mean? This fulfills several different agendas. So that's just like my thoughts on like the event portion of it, that that's the agenda being served. Then I think the surveillance piece is really important. The, that, that was my first thought was this is about, they want, they, it's going to now be to get into any kind of, a hotel, any place where there's more than a few people, you know what I mean? Like any place like a hotel or any kind of large center where there's a lot of people or whatever, it's going to, it's going to be that. Now this was outside. So but now you're already also, dealing with one of the most that Las Vegas is a city of cameras. That's right. That's right. Right. I, that, anybody that's been in Las Vegas, people who have lived there know damn well, you can't get away with much of anything in no. Las Vegas without being seen on camera. That's right. Much less what? Toting 15 to 20 rifles to the 32nd floor of I mean, a major yeah, hotel. This guy had a freaking arsenal. Arsenal. Really? Also, I'm sure. I'm sure that there's a lot of um, facial uh, biometrics and facial geometry scanning already going on there, and this would be a way for them but to. This is the mainstreaming of it, right? Main, to make it public, to make oh, it so that people agree. will accept it. Agree. Nobody will argue. People aren't going to be allowed to wear sunglasses or hats or anything like that when they're down there anymore. I, you know, you're now entering the zone of the Las Vegas Strip. Please remove your hats, your glasses, blah blah that kind of crap, and people right. will do it. It's like yeah. walking into a bank. Okay. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They'll be like the box in the bank yeah. where you have to go yeah. through with totally. Okay, right. so then you got the iPhone X massaging everybody's consent. Totally. The iPhone, you know, that I was out getting something to eat last night and there was a Sprint store and they have a sign on the window saying that they don't keep the new iPhone on, on premises overnight, right? Like people want it so bad. I'm like, this, this, these, this new phone is going to be your demise, people, and you want it so bad that they can't even keep it on site. Yeah. It, it's, it's pretty crazy. Okay, so then let's go over to the esoteric part of, of this. Obviously Can I just have one more thing about the surveillance piece? Yeah, please. It's not like they're going to have this problem, reaction, solution. Uh, they'll have it. They've already got it. Right. It's not like they're going to go send all these people scurrying to find the solution. No, it's already there. They've already got it. They have yeah. the technology. It's already baked. They just need more, the marketplace and the demand for it. They're just, we're in person of interest and they're about to turn on the machine. Have you guys seen this new series coming out on CBS called Wisdom of the Crowd? Have you seen this? No. It's, it's with uh, Jeremy Piven. Oh. And he plays, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, he plays somebody who has lost their daughter. And in order to find the daughter, he basically is doing a crowdsource thing mm -hmm. where all these people are using their cell phones mm -hmm. to send information. And wow. it's called Wisdom of the Crowd. And it sounds wow. really interesting on the surface, but that's just like, you know, there's it's having, it's everybody participate in the surveillance state. That's right. They're getting people to participate in the surveillance state. Yeah. 
No, and, the, and to be excited, to be excited, enthusiastic about it. Right, and they'll right, probably, exactly. There'll exactly. probably even be ways that you can score points if you find someone or something that's being looked for. You can. Yeah, score it's points. Pokemon Go. It's basically Pokemon the human Go. version of Pokemon, Pokemon Go. Go. Yeah. So that's what they were. I, that's what they were training us for. I said this last yep. summer. I said they're training us now mm -hmm. for two things: AI and surveillance state, and largely being active participants in this emergence. Po po I remember you, what we talked about Pokemon Go, and you wrote about this being uh, there to basically uh, get us to involve our consciousness in the expansion of the AI. Exactly. Well, so, so in the case of Pokemon Go, Pokemon Go is called AR, which is augmented reality. Yeah. Which is even sort of more dangerous than AI. Even more dangerous, yeah. More dangerous than VR because, and by the way, the Apple X is wired for augmented reality. Mm -hmm. Of course. And there are people all over the planet that are developing augmented reality tools. I, I actually know somebody who's doing it. Uh, augmented reality games, augmented reality realities. So the whole idea is that you'd have your cell phone up here. Yep. And it and, looks like the person is there, right? And they'd be, be in space, wouldn't be out here, be right here to be able to interact with them, right? Yep. This is so it's the augmented reality that is being going to be introduced into our midst. Randy, do you remember James Martinez, who, for those people who don't know, is a media ecologist talking about this all the way back in 2010? Yep. You remember that? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, this is a merger of the chip body with, with the meat sack body, yep. basically. And, okay. and, and a closing goes, off, by the way. Of consciousness because the more and more we immerse into augmented reality we take our vision and we compress it into a world that's immersive while at the same time blocking off everything else that's out there in the 360 degree axis around us so basically we're shutting down the real world in favor of this virtual world which is yeah. what they've, they've, they've been going for with things like oculus rift and Google yeah. Glass and all these other technologies. Well, even the way, let, let's just say for the sake of discussion, Robert, you were talking with your friend before we went on the air about this one, they're not going to be able to get away with this one. It's too sloppy. This is going to, you know, the lid's going to be blown on this one. It feels, it feels very sloppy. Yeah, if, yeah. If, if the lid is blown, it will be blown because of some of the cell phone camera videos that people have, right? right. So this will be even more of a way that people are interacting through their phone with the actual event. Right, like you can see, it's cell phone videos that are showing a shooter on the fourth floor. It's right. not anything we're getting from the mainstream media. It's only. I don't think they care. I really don't think at this point. No, I they think care. they want it. I, do I think too. they want. Yeah, it. yeah. I think they want. I think at this point, this may be when they're ready to let it go public that they create events, and that there's nothing you can do about this shit. We own you. We can create events. We can do whatever we want, and they'll always be. You know what I mean? I I I think this could possibly be. You know, I'm hearing, um, so first of all, I can't believe how many people that I've bumped into or talked to say they know somebody that was there. Apparently, one of the cooks at my work, a girl at another restaurant he works at, who's a waitress there, apparently died there. I ran into someone else today who said she knew somebody. So, like, this one reaches into all sorts of places, but also people who I've never known to question these kinds of events before are questioning it. People who are not conspiracy theorists, they're just going, wait a second, this doesn't make sense. I saw a video, it looks like it's on the fourth floor. Why are they saying it's on the 32nd floor? Right. So. This is the main. This is the mainstreaming of this. This is where it becomes. I mean, if they can, if they can mainstream the fact that they create events and still nobody does it, and still people, you know, just continue on with their normal the way they do things and whatever, then they know that they've got you. So they're ready to mainstream it. So am I correct in saying? Because to be quite honest with you, the last forty-eight hours, I've been really detached from the media. I'm vaguely aware of details right now. Me too. That this shooter was shooting from the 32nd floor of this building. Is that, is that what the story is? That he was shooting from... The 39th floor. The 39th floor. The 39th floor. And he's shooting to ground level. Floor. Am I, I heard, correct? I heard either 32nd or 38th. Okay, so... Shooting from two separate shooter. windows. Take the ballistics and trajectory tests that were done extensively over the JFK assassination... And let's just put that on steroids because the accuracy level of the shooter relative to the trajectory and distance to which he's shooting, you've got to remember a bullet travels a parallel plane. 
When you shoot down, you now have to correct for a downward angle and velocity adjustment on the bullet. But I, I think so. Bullets. He was it, 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 what, from what it seems like. He, there, he, it maybe seemed like it was they were, it was spraying. I don't know that this was targeted. It was more just spraying of the crowd. Um, I heard it was. I I feel like I heard it was on the thirty second floor. Um, but what was interesting is he seemed to be shooting from two different windows. There's like two windows that are shot out on the same floor, but seemingly far apart. Like it couldn't be the same person shooting out of both windows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's what I've heard. I, I played a, a scanner tape from the LVPD today on my show, which I found. And uh, they were talking, they were, it was very frenzied and, you know, a pretty, uh, uh, you know, pretty adrenalized and they were talking about the 39th and the 23rd floor mm. and they said that they had two they had two two shooters going on and they actually talked about how a security guard got wounded and they were tending to the security guard so apparently the security guard got involved and somebody came out of the room mm. to take on the security guard and, wow. and uh, hit him so I'm thinking that at the very least, they might have had multiple shooters in two different rooms. Huh, yeah. So that one person could continue to, to spray gunfire onto the crowd. Yeah. The other guy was really? the cleaner with the security guard. Yeah. That's, that's my feeling around this. And, um, you know, I don't know. We, we should get into the charges a little bit more. Can we do that? Please. Yeah, and I'll, I'll unpack my esoteric uh, thoughts after that, but let's do the chart. So one of the things that I, that I saw with the chart is um, – hold on one second. Just one thing here. Okay. Um, one of the things that um, – I saw this chart that was pretty interesting was that the midheaven, which is the point of contact with the world, right? We know what the ascendant is, which is kind of the body of the events, how we, how we interact with it, how we determine it, how we decipher sort of the meaning of the events. The midheaven is an Aquarius, Aquarius. And the moon is in Aquarius that night at 24 degrees. So the moon is, just, so the midheaven is the apex of the chart. The moon is just after the apex. So it's just beyond apex. And the moon in Aquarius is a very unusual moon because it is not an emotional moon at all. It's very detached. It uh, operates at about a 40,000 foot view. Um, it's quirky. It's eccentric. But it's also connected emotionally to kind of, you know, sort of utopian states and you know, kind of grander visions of how we can live on an emotional level. But the mood here is incredibly detached. And the midheaven is this kind of Aquarian sort of broadcast. And what's the whole goal around everything that's happening in the world, at least at some point, is to hurt us yeah. into kind of this one world experience, this one world ordered plan, you know. plan 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 cities epcot center for everybody absolutely let's yeah. you know it's, it's a small world after all all that shit it's the emerald kingdom right yeah. that's what it is what's really interesting and again i don't i can't you know make a specific correlation between stephen paddock and the event but stephen paddock has moon and aquarius in his chart so now we have not only moon and aquarius for the event at apex but he also has moon and Aquarius as well. And the other thing that was, that was interesting about his chart that I, is this whole relationship with Aries. Jason Aldean has, who was on stage at that time, he's a Pisces and he has Chiron and Aries in his chart. And Uranus was conjunct his natal Chiron in Aries in that moment. So it'd be very interesting to watch him and how he evolves post event. Will he become an anti-gun advocate? Right. You know, will he be one of these people who on the right comes out and says, hey, we got to get rid of our guns. You know, we've got, we've got, you know, curtail his violence. Now all of a sudden you have a country Western star coming out and, you know, talking about this stuff in, in this fashion, um, possibly. 
but also our friend, Mr. Stephen Paddock with the Moon in Aquarius, he also has some very interesting aspects as well with his true node, which is also an Aquarius. So just to, for people to understand, um, the true node is an aspect of the moon that's kind of our true north and where we need to go to in our charts. So this guy, Stephen Paddock, his kind of main goal in this lifetime was to like be friendly, create relationships with people, think of a better world. But then there's this piece that I kind of ran across earlier tonight. Oh yeah, Uranus was conjunct his natal Venus as well in Aries. So there again, there's this you know interesting connection with guns and violence and so from a chart perspective, I mean this guy's being triggered, literally figuratively. Yep. There's a triggering going on. Yeah. Now I just came across some information earlier tonight, whether it's true or not, I can't verify it. But apparently he there's this scuttlebutt, this dirt that he was an undercover FBI agent and that he was also involved in arms trafficking. So there's, there's some back chatter that this is kind of another fast and furious deal. Wow. That went bad. I mean, that, that, that actually makes a whole lot of sense. Like, or like a, a fast and furious ring was about to get found out. So they wanted to make a bus that looked like something else. Right. So he was yeah. set up. Maybe he was going to meet them at the hotel. Yeah. And, you know, do this deal. And the people who the arms were supposed to go to, whether it was ISIS, I mean, who knows, right? Antifa or whatever. And, yeah. and they found out about this thing and they went in and they snuffed him. And then they decided to cover their tracks. Now, if we go back to the chart, what's interesting is that Neptune, which is generally known as this aspect that has great hope and aspiration, but it can also take you into complete disillusionment and despair. Neptune is also in the 10th house, not at apex, but it's in opposition with Venus and Mars. So when we get into Neptune aspects, whether they're squares, tight conjunctions or oppositions, we have to ask ourselves, what's real? what's really taking place. And the Venus-Mars conjunction is unusual in Virgo. It, I mean, the Venus-Mars conjunctions don't happen that often. So in Virgo, it's all about attention to detail. Uh, it's in the fourth house here in the chart, which is home, connecting to values. Uh, and, but Mars, whatever sign it's in, it doesn't really matter, has this kind of Aries-like quality. You know, we're dealing with things like guns and ammunition and willpower. Even though it's in Virgo, which tempers it quite a bit, Venus and Mars and Virgo are attention to details. And the Neptune opposition makes things very, very fuzzy, very fuzzy. So again, from this perspective, where we're supposed to try to understand what's going on and isolate these events astrologically, it's not easy. Yeah. Because we want to get down to the Virgoan level. And what do we want? We want facts. But then we're taken back up to the 10th house, which is the world, and there's Neptune up there, and it's basically diffusing everything. Yeah. So this is, this is part of the event itself. And another thing that was really interesting, if you go back to the 9-11 chart, and this goes back even further, right? If you go back into the Bolshevik Revolution, which is, this is the 100th year of the Bolshevik Revolution. That's right. I, that, yeah. Isn't that November, November 4th, right? November 4th is the 100th it's, year? It's actually, it's actually November 7th. Okay. It starts on the 8th of March okay. in 1917 and culminates on the 7th of November in 1917. And what's really interesting about the Bolshevik Revolution is that Uranus is in the sign of Aquarius. Okay. So this is, this is the rebel call. This is where, you know, the revolutionary energies yeah. are stirred up. And, these, and every, people, these people understand these things. And well, all this Antifa people are saying they're going to start some... In November, thing. correct? Yeah. Okay. The last time that Uranus was in Aquarius was before and around the time of 9-11. Yeah. So we so have Uranus that. Uranus was in Aquarius around... So, Technically speaking, what happened during 9-11 was the shot across the bow for the next Bolshevik revolution. 
It was okay. many. Others. Yeah. Okay. And here we are with the same thing happening, and also the, the Saturn is in the Saturn uh, has Gemini right. We were talking about earlier Saturn and Gemini. Saturn's right. at the same degree. Yeah. Okay. Nine eleven as the ascendant of this event. So there's like a triangulation between all of these things. Right, and so if you take Uranus uh, in Aquarius on nine eleven, I think it's right around nineteen degrees or so. Mm -hmm. It puts it right at the mid heaven of this event. Yeah. Uh, so we're having these echoes, these Uranian echoes with Aquarius on the midheaven, Moon in Aquarius. We have the 9-11 Saturn. And even the, the day, the sun was at 9 degrees Libra, 11 minutes, right? 9-11. That's, that's, no. <laughs> that's where the sun was at the time yeah. this all happened. Yeah. So, okay, so this so this is the new 9-11 or this is the end of end of the 9-11 revel the, the ritual or something like that. Well, the problem is that all the emotional capital was spent. Yeah. Just like how there's absolutely no money that the country's bankrupt and everything's just fumes at this point. People have people also have no shits left to give. Yeah, we're, we're emotionally bankrupt. We had all this charge. Yeah. That we saved up pre 9-11. And, and then 9-11 happened, and we discharged all this very intense energy. Yeah. And I don't think there's much charge left. So, you know, hijacking people's emotional signals is much more difficult at this point in time. Yeah. But they may capitalize on the cynicism and yeah. the ennui that Randy was referring to earlier on. You know, it, it's occurred to me. I mean, like, I had a conversation with someone this morning, and I, in some ways I kind of felt like maybe I had upset her. And I said that, you know, all the, I, don't, I just have trouble believing all of this stuff. And she was like, oh, I knew somebody who was there and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, like that's the most dangerous thing is for us to all assume everything is always fake and not care. And then the real thing happens. And so Absolutely. we have to really be careful. We have to be on guard about that. We have to, yeah. you know, not lose our humanity in this. Um, let me, let me uh, get, let me unpack some of these esoteric uh, thoughts I had around this event. See what you guys think of that. So first thing I thought was okay this is interesting it's um the mandalay bay is connected to the luxor hotel right which is the black pyramid and i don't know and uh, to tie in your behold behold the pale horse for those who uh, used to listen to bill cooper he had a, a, a series called the mystery babylon series and in one or two of those actually it was in a couple of them he spoke about the uh the building and the erection of the luxor pyramid in Las Vegas and what it meant on mm, a sort of right, uh, occult and ritualistic uh, level. And he said that he went there for the opening and he could not believe the dark energies and the things that he saw and heard going on. So, you know, just like some people talk about where the towers erected with the, uh, with the no foreknowledge that this would be, that they would be brought down when they were, was this a ritual that had been planned from the very beginning of, of the black pyramid. So that's sitting over there um, in that black pyramid you have Chris Angel, who does a show over there called Believe, um, which is him in combination with Cirque du Soleil. And in the show, he pulls a hat out of a rabbit. Not a rabbit out of a hat, a hat out of a rabbit. So we're dealing with the complete inverse of everything that one would normally think of. And I don't know if you've seen some kinds of, you know, he's, um, he's extremely dark. He's gotten extremely um, weird and creepy over the years. He doesn't do his TV show or much other public stuff anymore because he's in this contract for, uh, that apparently is, there's a lot of uh, not good feelings between him and Cirque du Soleil, but that's what's going on over there in the pyramid every yeah. night, Believe show. Um, so there's dark magic in the pyramid, obviously, obvi as well as everywhere else in Las Vegas. There's more illusionists, magicians, dark, you know, that kind of stuff there than anywhere else. It's Sin City, but also some people call it Sun City, right? And if we're dealing with an eclipse, the ritual related to the eclipse and a black hole sun kind of ritual, this is a perfect place for that. Also, there are probably 10 or 20 iterations of Cirque du Soleil in Las Vegas, which is a sun worshiping, uh, basically, kind of artistic thing. Yeah. Um, and so there's that. There's one of the, there's a couple of them in. Mandalay Bay, there's the one with Chris Angel in the pyramid. Mandalay Bay is owned by MGM. Ma right, so we MGM's, have a Hollywood... Si MGM we, symbols a lion. The, the lion. Yeah, and, and the sun. Right, there we go. And um, so, you know, all of these things came up for me. 
um, when I heard about this. And then, of course, on the same day, we have the the death of or the you know death of Tom Petty, who Tom Petty of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, whose heart broke on the same day as this. He had went into cardiac arrest. And whenever there's any of these events, there's usually a sacrifice related. And um, it feels they're huh? It feels that way. Yeah, and so you know, basically, you had the head of the Heartbreakers, whose heart was broken, broken. for good. Yes, That's and um, you know, Tom Petty is a super interesting character. We're gonna, let's you know, this can kind of lead into our next thing that we want to talk about, which was him. Um, but we have this whole string for all year, but even, in, you know, going back into last year with Prince and David Bowie, of all these sort of uh, dark ritual kind of rock star deaths, and this year, all of them in some way Chris relating Cornell to the Jeff Black Hole Sun. Yeah. And, and uh, Tom Petty died when he was 66, right? Right, of course. You know, I mean, there's that number. And he was born on October 20th, 1950, which puts him right at the end of Libra. So not only did he um, die of a heart attack, but Jupiter was conjunct his son, which meant that there was this kind of magnification and expansion of who he was in that moment of time. So, you know, whether or not somebody said, hey, let's get Tom Petty, Jupiter's on his son, um, you know, I don't, I don't know about that, but clearly there's kind of a denouement moment with Jupiter's son conjunction. Like, and then after, you know, because, the, because Jupiter is the second son, right? So yes. it, it was this conjunction between his son and the second son. And um, there could be kind of this, you know, kind of apex moment in his life. Um, he was an interesting character and heavily Libran in his chart. But one of the things that I was really interested in was one of his later records. If I can find his, um, in fact, it's his last record. It's called Hypnotic Eye. Are you guys familiar with this record? I Wait. remember seeing. I remember seeing the cover when it came out. I actually out. blogged about this. That's right. I remember. You remember? Yeah. I did. Yeah. There was three albums that were released with a hypnotic cover. It was Yes's last album, Chicago's last album, and Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, which was called Hypnotic Eye. Yeah, go for it, Robert. Well, from what I know about the record is uh, Tom Petty was beginning to sing about the surveillance state. This is, this, this is you know, he, he was rejecting this kind of movement towards this um, cybernetic uh, synthesis that Randy was talking about. And the hypnotic guy with the strange hypnotic cover was really more of a, an exercise into exploring the nature and issue of privacy. That that's very interesting. I had forgotten about that. Um, Tom Petty is super uh, super interesting. I like his music a lot. I went through a very a phase where I was very into his music. Um, if you look at the if you listen to the words of his music and also the uh, image the symbol symbolic stuff and the imagery in his videos, very you know he has the one with that Alice in Wonderland and Don't Come Around Here No More. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, his, song, his song free falling is very interesting all about you know young ladies in los angeles and whatever but um i'll just share this i found i loved his music but i also found it to be quite triggering and um for me and of course at this time i didn't understand what it meant um in hindsight i understand exactly what it meant but his music was the first music i ever recognized that there was something weird going on with me in terms of bringing out um, tr uh, triggering uh, altered states or alters um, in terms of mind control and in terms yeah. of uh, the music very it was a the, that was the time in my life when I began to become aware and this was in the um, mid 90s about early mid 90s when I began began to become aware of that I was uh, being watched or being sort of surveilled or or observed kind of thing right uh, and uh, yeah, his mu you know, I think his music is great, but I think that there's a lot of, I mean, it, it's, uh, my body, it feels very strange right now, even as I'm talking about this, there's a lot tied into his music. And so um, the fact that later he's exploring this idea 
I mean, was he aware of like, you know, how, has he always been aware of this? Was he, well, you know, if you're in the music business and you manage the last 40 years, yeah, you, you've seen a lot. Everything. Yeah. Right? I mean, Tom Petty was, if I'm not mistaken, on Arista Records. I mean, maybe yeah. Randy could look that up. Clive that's Davis's Clive. label. That's Clive Davis. Oh, right. Of course. Yeah. And Let's not forget Bob Dylan, George Harrison, Jeff Lynne, Traveling Wilburys, you know, all the dark shit that has roiled around the Beatles. Whitney Houston. Whitney, of course. So Tom Petty knew. He knew. He was no dummy. He right. Saw happening. In fact, he had a major crisis once before where his house burned down. Yeah. I mean, was, was this, is, is he one of these people that has, there's also been rumors about this with Chester Bennington and with Chris Cornell and certainly with Prince that were sort of trying to blow the whistle from within in, or not blow the whistle, but trying to basically in, in, the, in whatever way they could make a comment about, you know, what's going on and their awareness of it. Okay. So here's something. I just looked up the lyrics to shadow people from hypnotic eye. I'm going to read you one verse of this. It says, and this one carries a gun for the USA. He's a 20th century man, and he's scary as hell because he isn't afraid. He will destroy everything you don't understand. What I aim at left, I aim to the right. Wow. Wow. That is like, that is prophetic. Think about Tom Petty's death and think about what happened in Las Vegas and in... The lyric itself yeah. is a foreshadowing. He knew, he, yeah, that he, this, this was a long time coming. He knew, you know what I mean? He, maybe he even knew it was coming. That's very intense. Okay. I'm, I'm going I'm to kick it up a notch if I can. Go. All right. So, okay. Where did we establish the moon was in this event? Where was the moon? In, in the, so the moon was the uh in well midheaven aquarius, aquarius. aquarius. yeah midheaven aquarius. aquarius yeah 24 degrees what was stephen paddock's moon where was it it was an aquarius wasn't it aquarius guess yeah. what tom petty's moon is aquarius aquarius 27 degrees conjunct jupiter right on the midheaven of this event so i i wonder if the it would be interesting to see the rest of the lyrics of that song was the song the script for the evening no, it's, it sure sounds ominously prescient. Yeah. Good wow. Point. The lyrics are really cryptic. It's called Shadow People, and it's off of that last Heartbreakers album. And that was the last one. What was it, it? it says, and one lyric goes, if you're thinking to look, you may be thinking at pain. I guess that pretty much, I guess that pretty much it can call you away. Shadow people in a shadow land, like I'm thinking at the great one and the other one comes worse. Sometimes his lyrics don't sound good read because he's so yeah. rhythmic. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, there's some weird foreshadowing that goes on in the lyrics to the song. Wow. Interesting stuff. He made great music, man. And he was an unusual cat for sure. One of a kind. And um... let me just address something that I've seen especially in social media the last few days, because people want to react to this. And most people are trending on the two sides. And this goes back to what Robert and I were talking about, and you as well, Em, of how we feel jaded by all this. Yeah. And people feel like they need to reach out. They feel like they need to embrace the sorrow and the grief and all of that. And at the same time, somehow shield their own skepticism with a sense of humanity. I, I've kind of resisted that on the side of just being an analyst at this point, just because the patterns start to congeal. Yeah. And, and I think people need to be careful and understand that all of this is designed to manipulate you emotionally. So whatever emotion you express will be deemed inappropriate by one party and another party we we'll embrace it because we're social beings. Right. And they want that. They want that in the mix. They want that in the play because that plays off of the emotional trajectory totally. and the impact. 
totally. Like I had, an, I had that encounter today with a friend who I felt like I really upset her and I later went to apologize to make sure she was okay because I wasn't sure she was okay with what I had said. So yeah, they, they like to create that sort of emotional attachment and that tension between people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, I'm, yeah, it's like this, um, this kind of slingshot effect that they, that, you know, it's not the opposition, you know, it's, it's the field that's inside the opposition. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what they mine, right? Like if you, yeah. if you get two magnets and you put one this way, one this way, and you go like this, you know, you can feel that flux field in between, right? Yeah. Because you, you, you want to push them together and they want to push apart. Um, and this is the field that they generate with these events, which are meant to stir up more and more opposition, you know, on the heels of the NFL. So what happens now when you go to a football game? Well, first of all, if you go and you're not staying at home because for whatever reason you're, you're not down with, these guys and what they're doing, you're looking over your shoulder. You're thinking, God, is somebody going to bring a rifle in here? You know, is this going to be, is this going to be a, a nice? Well, that's been hinted at for uh, decades uh, now that yeah. somebody was going to do. That was a movie plot at one point. That was called Black Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, it was with Bruce Dern. Yeah. There, there, I went through a phase where I was like afraid to go to the Dodger game with my dad because I was afraid something would happen there. Hey, I think you're probably right about that. There's other reasons to be afraid to go to Dodger games, but <laughs> I don't think it's the terror bit. That's for sure. Um, well, yeah, usually, so, usually when we go to the Dodger game, they always lose. Even if they're on a tremendous winning streak, we go, they lose. So, you know, <laughs> that's usually the biggest fear. But no, I was definitely afraid for a while. Well, I think that, the, that these events prey upon people's existential fears of being in open spaces now. Mm -hmm. And of course, the you know which we talked about, which was the the surveillance state and panoptical society, which is you know kind of what drives all of this. We're under surveillance twenty four seven, or at least we we are, even if we don't know about it. Um, but what's really going on, you know, in the midst of all of this, what's taking place? Whether we you know this, because what happened with this event is that there there are all these bring this back to Chris Angel in Las Vegas. Yeah. There are all these kinds of things that are taking place. And one of the predominant energies you know, symbolically of that day is the magician. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, the day, it's a one day, and one is the number of will and magic. Um, ten is the wheel of fortune, which is Las Vegas, right? Um, but it's also, if you break it down, it's one. So we have sort of double magic, and we have 11. We have echoes of 9-11. So there's this thing happening, and we're looking at it, and we're breaking it down. And I think for whatever reason now, we're, we're kind of entrained to do this, for better or worse. Um, but what's also going on that we're not seeing? You know, we're, you know, what's taking place that we're not looking? I, I, I would be curious to know where Chris Angel was at the time this happened. From, I, I, if I recall correctly, he has a penthouse in the Luxor. Yeah. So the penthouse would be the capstone on the pyramid, right? Yeah. But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There's, there's, there's things going on. I mean, the things, no one has talked about what was going on in Congress that day. Could they have put a bill through that day? Uh, you know, uh, the focus was completely taken off of what was going on in Puerto Rico after this. All the things yeah. that we were paying attention to, yeah. now it's all just this. That's right. Remember on the day of the Boston bombing, Congress like did that thing where they made it so that they could do insider trading again. Yeah. Yeah. You yep. know? Well, not only that, but you have this at another level, which is the archontic level, the energy harvesting, the loose harvesting. Yeah. And you've got it's ninety one harvest festival. Right? Yeah. The harvest festival. And you've got a group of people who are gathered together in a very energetic exchange, concerts. Anything, sports events, anything that pulls large numbers of people together is an energy vortex. It's a In front of a pyramid. Yep. In the center of one of the most electrical cities in the United States. Yeah. Harnessing all that energy and triangulating it on an apex. This has a ritualistic, sacrificial 
aspect to well, it. Or, and remember that tons Luxor, of levels. Remember when the Luxor has that light that points straight to the sky? Yes, yeah. That beam, so it's kind of like all this energy kind of being shot up. That of sort of course. Yeah. Yes. For sure. So is Tom Petty a sacrifice? Yeah. It sure feels like it. Yeah, and O.J. Simpson is released from prison. So the trumpet, the first trumpet with O.J. Simpson, and where are we now? We're getting to the end. How, what, 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 what trumpet? What, what trumpet are we on now? <laughs> Randy should know that. <laughs> Boy, it's feeling like the sixth, sixth trumpet. Yeah, am that I, is interesting. That O.J. <laughs> okay, so, wow. And then the other person that we lost uh, in the last week was uh, Hugh Hefner, also with a significant tie to Las Vegas. And, and another Aries. Yeah, and a significant tie to mind control and programming and all of that kind of stuff. Um, sex magic, for sure. Um, let's hear, yeah, what do you got to say about that, Robert? Well, before we jump into Hugh Hefner, I'm looking at the chart for Las Vegas, which I had not done prior to tonight. I just punched it up. And the midheaven for Las Vegas is 29 Aries. So Uranus, transiting Uranus, conjunct Las Vegas' midheaven in Aries. So it's an explosive event. It's violence. Uh, you know, it involves police. It's, 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 um, it happens theoretically, spontaneously, although it's probably non-spontaneous. But what's interesting about Las Vegas is that Mercury is right on the midheaven uh, at 29 degrees also, which brings a kind of compulsive energy to the city, right? There's like, you know, this, it's a city of dreams. It's like, hey, we're going to go there. We're going to hit a bay. We're going to, you know, we're going to get, you know, we're going to get laid or I'm going to have this amazing experience. It's like this unleashing of sort of this, this um, aspect of will, but it's almost desperate at 29 degrees, right? Is it, because then it goes into um, Taurus, the next sign at zero, so Uranus was right on the top of, the, of Las Vegas' chart, you know, the night of the night of this event, and will be really until probably at some point next year, because well, actually it goes to be 2019, because Uranus goes into Taurus and it goes back into Aries. So Uranus is going to be this kind of explosive and dynamic and <clears throat> destructive energy that's going to be around Las Vegas for the next two years. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to the city after this. Like, what's going to happen with tourism? I mean, are people going to go flock to Las Vegas again? I don't know. I mean, are we that, are we that like, reprobate, you know, that we just say, fuck it, and we just go back there and, you know, go try to un unleash our, our, our pent-up desires? Well, my dad theorized that, like, you know, because Las Vegas – Anyway, they always offer a lot of really good deals on hotel rooms, especially for people who are members of certain hotels and clubs. My dad's theorizing that now, like that they're going to be offering, giving rooms away. And I, and I bet you, especially because, because the American people are impulsive and especially a lot of people don't necessarily have a lot of money to spend on a lot of vacationing. If they're offered something for, for, for free, they might jet right there and have their um, induction into the complete and total uh, planned surveillance kind of environment, um, you know, because if it's free, people will go. Well, certainly, it will incentivize them. Yeah. Okay, here we go. You ready? Yep. Do you know who's born the same day as Hugh Hefner? Stephen Paddock. Oh, boy. <laughs> I didn't know there was going to be a connection. How weird is that? Wow. Well, that, I mean, that almost makes it the reason that it was him. Yeah. Very strange. I mean, that is very strange. Very, very strange. You know, sometimes you get these feelings, right? Like, you say, you know, because I'm punching the Pew Hefner's chart, and I'm thinking, I bet you he's got the same birth. Because I knew he's an Aries. Right. Now, well, let me load the chart. Um, that's interesting. So just another little strange bit of errata and ephemera. You know, my thing about Hugh Hefner, like, I mean, there's a public side to Hugh Hefner, and then there's the private side to Hugh Hefner. And one of the private sides to Hugh Hefner was the Playboy Mansion, speaking of 
surveillance was wired with cameras everywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you were visiting the Playboy Mansion and you got into kind of a weird place with one of the bunnies, one of the little mind control. <clears throat> it's all being recorded. It's all yeah. recorded. Well, I'm sure that's where a lot of sexual blackmail took place in terms of, you know, Absolutely. Stuff. Yeah. This was the Absolutely. template for it. Yeah. Absolutely. So the Playboy Mansion is wired for sound, wired for video, and if you are engaged in some form of moral indiscretion, they got you. They got you. So that's, the, that's I think, part of the behind the scenes yeah. piece. Um, I think another part of the behind the scenes piece was that um, Hefner was charged with this because he's an Aries and he connects into this kind of, in a, in a strange way, this masculine spirit of Aries, that he was kind of charged with the disassembling of the male, even though it was postured as being liberating for, for man, right? Yeah, no, you for sure. Out, get laid as much as you can. You're in college. You don't want to get married. You've got all this testosterone. There's a, there's a plethora of choices out there for you. Well, it's a disassembling of the male disguised as a disassembling of the female. Well, it was a juvenilization of the male. It basically locked men into a perpetual adolescence. Absolutely. And, and the objectification of women mm-hmm. yeah. as a result of that. Yeah. Like the centerfold, you could have power over this. This could yeah. be yours. Right? This is the, and, and so as a result of that and, and this – infantilism and the and, and look and i grew up in the 70s yep. you know, and i got Me sucked too. in by playboy right i mean big time think about it think about your first time that you glanced at right. women like this it was a playboy pinup calendar in some dad's garage probably playboy penthouse yeah. we yeah. it was all part it was all part of our adolescence and 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 kind of supercharging you know, our, our, our libido, hypothalamus, everything, and putting us in a place where it was really, really disempowering and, and crushing for any kind of, of intimacy. And then the women had their own version of it, right? They had their own version with, with Gloria Steinem. Cosmo. And, and Cosmo. Yeah. And, and so as a result, you know, both sexes think they're being empowered yeah and tapping into their psychic and sexual resources and but in both actuality, the- it was tossing us you know into the barrio of loneliness isolation and and um you know fantasies that could never be fulfilled or desired and if they were they wind up being hollow right and and interesting how both of them were the actual assembly of the male or the female disguised as the disassembly of, disassembly of the other, right? So with Gloria Steinem, you have the whole idea that the women are liberated from men, they don't need men and whatever. So in some ways it's disguised as, oh, we're breaking down the males, we're getting rid of the males, but it was really breaking down the women as well. Oh, absolutely. Or so. So each one disguised as the disassembly of the other. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, it might be interesting too, you brought this up, it triangulates. I had this conversation with our friend, Shane the Ruiner, on Sunday night. And we were talking about this kind of weird trough we're in with the sexual revolution and this whole gender neutral, non-binary expression. And one of my theories is that that is actually a biological working out now of the polarization that has occurred since the Really, it started in the 50s, but by the 70s, it was on steroids. That we now have a generation, that, at least in some minority position, is expressing the concept that they're so done with the gender wars, they're done with gender. That they're not expressing as gender anymore. It's a weird kind of... I, I see it yeah, as... Here's some, what I think. I, I think that there is maybe some truth to that. If they're at a kind of a more advanced age but Mm -hmm. i'm not sure not this changing little kids thing right right i'm I'm not sure five-year-old works that out i think it's the parents that are working that out and from the parental perspective i think that that might have some real estate but i don't think a four or five-year-old has that no matter 
how quickly they're introduced into. No, we're, we're talking, we agree on that. Well, yeah. and I think, I think the, um, the push from the media and the societal push towards all this um, gender neutral stuff and all this uh, transgender kind of thing is a way to hijack this time where it, uh, there's for a lot of people, they're starting to really balance their uh, inner male and female qualities and energies. And they want to distort that just, you know, they want to distort that and make it about uh, gender and about, you know, if you're having, you know, uh, thoughts, feelings or whatever that are considered male, well, then maybe you should change your outside to match that rather than integrating that. I like what my friend Danny said, rather than transcending and including, you know, cutting things off or removing them altogether. Um, well, is what they would prefer. They, so they, this has been ongoing. This has been happening yeah. for a long time. And we, you know, I think we've talked about this. You go back to the 60s and you, we have the Beatles and the Stones and long hair, which by today's standards is laughable, right? But it, but it, it took place. It came right out of the playbook of Tavistock. Well, and, you know, we're going to get a generation yeah. at a certain point in time in their development and we're going to bring in this whole idea of sexual and gender, either confusion or option. Yeah. And, and didn't, didn't I mean, Hugh Hefter, this whole thing kind of comes from Tavistock as well. You know, that was sort of the creation of a Project Monarch Playground sort of there. Right? Hugh Hefter is one of these guys that comes out of Chicago. That's where he's from. And if you ever drill down into Chicago and look at who comes from Chicago, it'll blow your freaking mind. You know, like for instance, um, Saul Linsky comes from Chicago. Of course. Yeah. Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton, Bill Ayers. I mean, Chicago's got Barack this, Obama, basically. Barack Obama. I mean, Chicago is like this launching pad for you know these people and these groups and and these energies. It's like the dark heart right in the middle of the bit of the. Well, yeah. Chicago is the heart chakra of the United States. Yeah. And so what they've done, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. I think Charles Taze Russell comes from Chicago as well. I, you'd have to drill down. Wow. Pretty short. But I also I know that this whole kind of Moorish science sort of idea and ideology, that comes from Chicago. So, so here you have, like, people who are literally, like, leeching onto the heart of America. You know, they're, they're like these... I, you know, I don't know what you would call them, succubus, on the heart shock of America, and everything is like being sucked out of from that place. You know, it's, it, anyway. Um, Russell actually came from Pittsburgh, which may be more scary because that's yeah. the Illuminati I was, I was not, city. I was, I was not clear on that, so I didn't yeah, want Pittsburgh's to, the Illuminati city. I didn't want to commit to that. But um, getting back to Gloria Steinem, she's also an Aries. <laughs> Right? So now you have these two people. You've got Hugh Hefner on the male side, Gloria Steinem on the female side, and Aries is just do it. Right? It's, just, it's the just do it. It's a, you know, that's what Aries does. So we have these two seminal figures in the 1960s on the masculine and feminine, both representing the sign of Aries and Will, which is kind of interesting. So wow. but we're, we're going to, we're, here's, here's what I think is going to happen. I think that we have Chiron coming into Aries, which happens around the 20th of April in, in next year. And the last time Chiron was in Aries was started was 1970, which is the birth of the women's movement. It's the birth of feminism, 1970. Clearly, that's the year that it gets kind of rubber stamped and they have- It's also this, the birth of the ecological movement. This is true. Wow. And, and you know, it gets into sort of the end of the Vietnam War and Watergate and the end of Summer of Love and Kent State. I mean, these are all things that are happening right when Chiron goes into Aries. So we're coming back again in, in March of this year, or April of this year, rather, 2018. And I feel like, because I think there's this, like, pretty kick-ass intelligence in the universe. I really do. And in spite of all of our bullshit, in all of our games, is kind of there to help us work things out in, in mostly a benevolent fashion. So here we come around again with Chiron and Aries, 
And what did we do the first time? Well, it was women who said, we matter, our lives count, we don't want to stay at home. You know, whether or not the Rockefellers were instigating it, which according to Aaron Russo was really what was up, Gloria Steinem was CIA, yes, it's a social movement, but, but also I think women probably said, I want to have some kind of voice in my life. I don't want to be tied to, you know, all these appliances. And so we've gone through this cycle, this, this chironic cycle, and it's coming around again. And I think it's the men's turn this time. And I think that men are going to all of a sudden kind of wake up and say, we've had it. You know, we've had this bullshit. You know, it's really interesting. I watch a lot of commercials. And for the past, I don't know, five to six years, I've been watching the disappearance of the white male. Yeah. On commercials. Yep. And, if they, and if they do show up, they're completely effeminate. They're or they're an idiot. Well, that was, I was going to say they're a boobus, right? Or yeah. they're a dork or they're overweight and disgusting. Exactly. There's no, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, and, and so now who becomes the new symbol of sturdiness, strength, stability, foundation of the black male, right? And, he, and often in contrast with this really kind of poor version of the white male. So it's been going on for a while, but I've noticed some changes. And I've been watching now where there's this kind of integration that's taking place. And, a, and there's a commercial for, I think it's insurance. And there is, a, it's a terrible, I mean, it's a terrible commercial on a lot of levels, but it's a, it's a, it's a black American family. They're in an SUV. And there are two kids in the back, and there's a wife in the front, guys driving, the kids and the wife, the kids are teenagers, they've all got their, their earbuds in. They're all listening to something different, and none of them are connecting. And the guy is having a conversation with himself, and he's basically saying, hey, look, you know, I have my life. You know, I went out, and uh, even though they're not listening, I got something going on. I got a rebate and I went out and I bought that new putter and she doesn't even know about it. And you know what else? Sometimes I leave the toilet seat on. And I thought to myself, congratulations, black America. You are now in the position of being cucked, right? I mean, this is what's happened. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating to watch. It's fascinating to go from these kind of symbols of displacement all of a sudden, well, guess what? You're in the driver's seat now. You get the same treatment that every other man has gotten. You're no different. You yeah. see, I think that this is a unifying theme. And men are going to wake up. And, then, and they're going to say, you know, we've had enough. We've clearly had enough. I mean, it's already been going on. You know, with, uh, what is it, the, uh, the MRA movement, the men's rights movement, men's rights activists. If you watch yeah. that, the Red Pill this woman who's a filmmaker, she's a feminist, and she starts interviewing all these guys. From, I saw her. Yeah, I saw yeah. an interview with her. Fascinating. What, 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 what was your take on that, Emily? So I, she, I saw her interviewed on the Dave Ru on Rubin Report, on the Rubin yeah. Report, and it was very interesting how she um, basically like moved from this, the spot, her perspective over to this like, place where she had a lot of compassion for these men, a lot of these men who had had their children taken away from them, a lot of these men who um, basically have been reduced to second class citizens and really um, allowed herself to have a transformation. I have not seen the movie, I have not seen her documentary, but it was interesting. I saw this a while ago, so I'm not remembering the exact details of the interview. But yeah, this was a person who, you know, allowed her humanity to come through and to have a transformation based on the experience she had with these men. And I, you know, I, um, I've seen this for a long time. Like I, there's definitely been, you know, this, uh, I mean, actually James Martinez was also the second time he's brought up tonight was the first person I heard talk about this back around the same time, like 2009 or 2010. And I could see it a little bit then, but it's become so it's very, very obvious. Um, and yeah, like, I think it's, um, I agree with you, Robert. I think men are sick of it. And I think they're going to, I think they're, they're going to do something. And I actually completely support them in that because I think this, I find this whole thing to have been obnoxious um, and not good for anybody. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. 
Um, and so I wrote, I actually did a, did a podcast about it uh, last week and I was talking about the NFL and thinking that, you know, it's probably really good if the NFL does die because so many men just like playboys. It's really interesting because we had the Hugh Hefner event. Ah, the death and of had, the, and then we had the NFL. The which, death of the death of Playboy and the death of the NFL could actually bring men back to themselves. Well, theoretically, I mean, it's object. Yeah. Both of them are objectification, right? Yeah. As men, we we project ourselves into these bodies that do things that we could never do, and you know, maybe we fantasize about what they do when they're not off the field and all the money and you know all that stuff. It's right out of Greek hero worship, right? Yeah. So if the NFL dies, I mean, it's really symbolic in a lot of ways. And Hugh Hefner's passing is really symbolic. And it can be really incredibly healthy for us. Yeah. But all of a sudden now, what are, what are we going to, you know, we're, we're, it's coming back to like us and who we are and, you know, how as men we've advocated our wills in a lot of ways for many different reasons. Um, and it'll be a very interesting time. And so what happens is now we got a guy named Stephen Paddock who at 63 years of age goes theoretically full postal, which is highly doubtful, but he's born under the sign of Aries. And so here's this kind of masculine energy coming up again. So we get to look forward to that in uh, April, right around 420 uh, this coming year in 2018, when Chiron will be in Aries for seven years. And it, it impacts women too, because you know, women who have Chiron and Aries, many of whom were born in the 1970s, right? 1970, 71, seven-year cycle, all the way up to 1977, 78. Um, these women also have their <laughs> issues around power and the sublimation of power and, and shutting it down and, you know, all these things that, that women during that phase, period, cycle have had to endure and go through and, you know, be the nice girl or whatever that is. They've got their own thing that they're going to have to deal with this Aries and Chiron. The other thing too, is that the United States has Aries and Chiron in its chart, natal chart. So the United States will go through its Chiron return and that's at 20 degrees Aries. And how I see that ultimately is, is that that is the war at home. You know, that's the fourth house home where we live. And maybe, wouldn't it be great if maybe, just maybe, we were all just so tired and weary and shouting at each other and just said, you know, to hell with this. You know, let's, let's lay down our arms. You know, let's, let's really talk. You know, let's bring in some vital information and then turn around and look at who's pulling the strings on all of this, right? I mean, I really think that, I mean, maybe it's a pipe dream, but I'd love to see that happen. I, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. I actually think this whole stunt with the NFL is sign of uh, desperation at creating racial division. So I think that like whatever they hoped to have happen with all of these uh, protests and riots and stuff in Charlottesville and Berkeley uh, in Boston or whatever, the kind of racial division and you know civil war kind of environment that they hoped that that would create didn't really happen. And so their their last option was sort of to move it into the, you know they have keep kept people like the biggest mind control spot for a lot of americans has been sports right like that's a way to keep people not paying attention to what's going on in the rest of the world it's also so, a refuge for men a refuge There's for men and, politics, right, right right so move this racial thing over there and hope that it hope that it it works there you know what i mean and 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 hope that you know yeah, that the, the fight you couldn't create on the street, you could create now by having this weird thing. But I don't think, I mean, I think there's a couple of people who are behind it and think it's a good idea. But I think for the most part, people, um, you know, even though the bread and circuses in some ways have stolen their life, they want, they, still, they want that, they want their bread and circus. They don't want to have to worry about all this other stuff when they're there. They want to go to the game or they want to watch it on TV. They want to have a couple of beers. They want to eat some wings and they don't want to think about all of the other stuff. That's and right. I think this was a gamble that ultimately is a, a losing one for them because I don't think it's going to work. And I think people who have been asleep are suddenly going to start paying attention going, hey, wait a second. How come the only place I could go to get five minutes of peace now I can't get five minutes of peace anymore? What's going on? Why is this happening? I don't like this. You know what? I'm going to make peace with, with my neighbor or, my, or these other people now so that I can have peace all the time and not have to just go to the ball game for peace. 
Right. Well, that's true. And when yeah. you know, it's like the quality of life could really elevate, you know, on Sundays and, and thereafter. I mean, I stopped watching the NBA with any kind of consistency about four or five years ago. I just was not interested. Football, it's kept me around only because I play fantasy football. I know it sounds kind of funny, but I do. Um, but it's, you, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, there's this theory that we're given these sports by the elites, right? Mm -hmm. So that we can somehow work out our aggression, just like we have an election every four years. Right. Gives us this illusion of choice. Well, it's, it's for misplaced tribalism too. So you put your tribal, your tribalistic instincts there instead of right. out in the real world. Yeah. Right. But, but they also say, okay, they can channel this. Yes. They can channel this. They can, you know, through through their projection. But if they, if that gets taken away, you know, what are they saying? Are I mean, if if they're orchestrating this, maybe they are to some degree. Are they saying that we're we're now willing to rip off this kind of prophylactic? between people and their aggression and the spectacles that we create in order for them to project into them? And if so, you know, what does that mean? Are they going to turn us against each other? Are they willing to face the wrath of, you know, the crowd? I mean, this is a very interesting moment in time. I think, it, I think it's a gamble. I think, I think it's a gamble. Either it can, will go their, their way or will horribly not go their way. And right. I think their I think their hubris is so great that they were you know they and and that they probably thought that if we do this with enough enough celebrity fanfare and enough around it the fools will fall for it. And I well, think let's just look at this. Let's just look at this whole milieu for a minute. This whole NFL thing, which is on a surface level, and I've said this for years, the best sports ever were for me was playing Sandlot football tag football, tag team, baseball, the same thing. When you get sports to the scale that you have it on a professional level, you have created this, this colossus, first off, that requires huge amounts of investment in infrastructure from the, quote, public. So to build a stadium in any location means you have massive amounts of graft and bribery involved, all oh, kinds yeah. of business interests. Yeah. This is corporatism on steroids. Then it wraps itself in the flag right from the start. You got to stand up for the goddamn Star Spangled Banner. And if somebody has a problem with that, I'm sorry. I have a problem with the Star Spangled Banner. It's a yep. war song. It's a war chanty. Yep. Secondly, thirdly, actually, the U.S. Army, the military, is one of the biggest sponsors of... And all these were, they, they pulled way back down. I mean, between 1995 and I think, what, 2015, huge sponsor. Huge. Well, they're all over. They, they, whatever they've pulled back in football, they've put into baseball. Because one of the things I find really obnoxious about going to the baseball game is all the military worship that happens in the, you know, first 15 to 20 but to 30. Even minutes. just look at what happens obnoxious. on a Super Bowl game. When they have the flyovers. And then let's talk about the Illuminati halftime show. Right? Hey, that's right, absolutely. Because Which, really, it would at the end of the, the event, by the way, right? at the end of hey, that he's season. Not perform this year. <laughs> at the end of that season, what they're really telling you is who controls the whole thing. That's right. Yeah. It's all about the big eye. It's yeah. all about doing the ritual on the field one last time because it's the field of play of the gods. This is and, this is a giant outworking of a and cosmic play in the football field totally. is just, it's a scale model of something that happens on a galactic level. Totally. Is that, is that too much? Did I just? No, no, not, no, that, not at That's all. exactly right. I think the only thing you left out was, you know, this whole idea that we're somehow standing up uh, <laughs> at the beginning of these games um, to celebrate and, uh, pay homage to our freedom and the men and women that fight for it, which is really a bunch of horse shit. Of course, it's right. a bunch we of have, horse shit. We're, 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 <laughs> you know, we're over in Afghanistan, basically, you know, guarding the poppy fields <laughs> so we could have record amounts of opium, right? which wind up here in this country as an opioid crisis. Right. Yes. Well, also, if, 
if they're if they're if this is about so fighting but I, but I don't but hold on real quick but the reason why they're kneeling has nothing to do with that so. no no it has right. nothing to do, right nothing to do with that it's like some weird misguided kind of george soros blm side yeah. right but yeah so but well, so does anybody it, even remember what Caper Next's orig original deal was? Police brutality. Okay. Well, I know a lot about Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. So, a mm -hmm. couple of things. So, also, if we're supposed to be paying homage to the freedom that we have, what freedom? You just had to go through metal detectors and get set your body searched to come into the football game. That's what right. freedom there? Oh, please, and, you're talking now about my trip to Houston and back. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, but then also, like, yeah, exactly what you said that what 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 is this kneeling about there was i was watching a video on youtube the other day i don't know this woman's name an african-american woman who was talking about how pissed she was because this is a ridiculous in every way because she went and looked for last year how many players in the nfl had been arrested for drunk driving or stolen weapons or or uh, things like that all these things and then they're taking Murder. Gun, <laughs> complaining about My that count is pretty significant yeah, it was it like is. over 700 people in the NFL mm -hmm. last year had been charged with like possession of a stolen weapon, driving while under the influence, and she's tr trying to understand. Those are the ones we hear about. Right. She's, tr she, she's sitting there trying to understand how the white cops possibly got them to have the stolen weapon, possibly, you know what I mean? Like she, it, she's sitting here having that moment of discovery of this doesn't make any sense. What the hell are you guys doing? Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's a, the whole thing is incredibly bizarre, and uh, I think it's a total psyop. Colin yep. Kaepernick started it all off, and he got politicized by his girlfriend, Nessa Diab, yep. who is a DJ in New York City. I wrote about this a long time ago. I wrote mm -hmm. about it when it first came out. Isn't she kind of like a, um, like almost like a younger version of like a Tupac Shakur's kind of mother? Uh, Nessa Diab, she, yeah. she, she's Egyptian. Right, and, what I'm saying is like, she's into like the same kind of activism. That what yeah, she's, she's definitely a full blown, full on activist. Communist, isn't she? She's a communist too, I believe. Well, she's a Muslim and I'm probably a communist. I mean, okay, you know, I didn't know she was a Muslim, I didn't, yeah. but she's a Muslim. Okay. And the whole thing started when Colin Kaepernick was on the 49ers and Nessa Diab was dating another member of the 49ers, a guy by the name of Alden Smith. And Kaepernick basically stole her from Alden Smith. Now, this guy is the quarterback of the team, and it had a ripple effect on the team. And Alden Smith, who was actually kind of a nutcase and a head job, um, went after Kaepernick during a practice, and then he, and then he bashed up Kaepernick's car. And I, and I talked about this and I, I brought it out. People were laughing at me at the time, but it's true. So, so he, he basically helped begin the demise of the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. Huh. With that. And now he's basically helped begin the demise of the NFL. Of the NFL. Um, and Kaepernick's an interesting story. His mother, um, her last name is Russo, and she gave him up for adoption. He was born in Wisconsin, and she gave him up for adoption to a family that lives in Turlock, California, who happened to be white. And, of course, Colin Kaepernick is mixed, and his mother is Italian. She lives in Denver, Colorado, and he won't speak to her. To this day, he won't speak to his mother. And he, um, you know, I don't know what his relationship like, is like with his birth family, but um, he's definitely had a chip on his shoulder. He's angry. He's been angry for a long time. Astrologically, he's got a Sun-Pluto conjunction in Scorpio. I mean, that's powerful. You know, that's destructive. And he's got a moon in Aries to boot. So, you know, he's playing out a specific role. I mean, whether or not you like him, whether or not you believe in his cause, which I'm not even sure he understands at this point, but maybe he does. Um, he's playing the role of kind of a Shiva-like character in the NFL. That's, yeah. his, that's his role to play. He's bringing on the destruction. That's really interesting. And, and wow. he's playing it even though he's not playing in the NFL anymore. That's right. That's yes. right. Yeah. And his, and his uh, talent and skill set is nothing to go run out and grab off the street and he's going to make you a better team. And at this point, he's kryptonite. No team will 
you know, the one team that actually brought him in for a trial was the Seattle Seahawks, who are probably the most progressive, socially just team in the NFL. And even they wouldn't sign him. Yeah. So, you know, he'll be, he'll be the, the Rosa Parks of football. Wow. Cool. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah so you, 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 th- you think that this is the demise of the NFL? You think I've been talking about the demise. Yeah, of- I know you have, yeah. For the last three years now, been, I remember you talking about it a lot when the rice incident happened and when all the start, stuff started happening. People talking about the concussions and the head injuries. You've been going on about this for a while. You think this is like, the, the, you think this is the mainstreaming of that idea? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. If you if you look at the San Diego Chargers now, the Los Angeles Chargers, right? They can't even get ten thousand people in their new stadium because they left San Diego to go to LA uh, thinking that uh, they'd get a Well, you know, that's the other thing too. Let's face it. These teams pack up and leave town. They change. There's no loyalty anymore. No loyalty at all. No no loyalty at all. It's all about who will build them the biggest stadium, right? So back when the 49ers were in San Francisco and they were being run by Eddie DiBartolo, Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, Right. right? Right. And his old man basically was about, you know, you know, one one degree of separation from the mob. The, if that. If that. I'm being kind here. Right? You are. Being kind. Uh, so, um, actually, they're from Youngstown. My bad. They're yes. Youngstown. Yep. Youngstown. Youngstown, Ohio, but Youngstown. Pittsburgh. And, and yep. Pittsburgh, Eddie D. Bartolo Jr. owned the Pittsburgh Penguins for a brief period. Mm-hmm. That's what mm-hmm. So, he was running the 49ers. And, they man, to get a stadium pass in San Francisco – You'd either have to be an act of God or an act of Satan, one of the two, right? <laughs> so, so, so they did this. They actually got this thing done, but they completely, like, through the election, they found ballots in the Bay. I mean, it was a complete and total mess. They were going to turn Candlestick Park into this, um, you know, stadium, shopping plaza, mm-hmm. This, you know, this entertainment web dream. And then what happened was, <laughs> this is really interesting. And you can look this up. It was in the run-up to the election, and Carmen Policy and some of the 49er people were at this event that was being thrown by Jack Davis. And Jack Davis was one of the supervisors, or he was really connected. He was also flamboyantly gay. And he brought this guy in to do this entertainment for this fundraiser for the Niners. And this guy did a satanic ritual right there at this fundraiser. And um, it's, it's kind of, you have to kind of drill down into the internet to find it, but you'll find it. And this guy was very conscious of this satanic ritual that he was creating. And after that, Eddie DiBartolo Jr. got caught in a sting in Louisiana with Edwin Edwards. And it was a payola sting. And he was actually going to pay Edwin Edwards off to get a gambling casino. So this happens after this like weird little satanic performance art piece. And then from that point forward, pretty much everything the 49ers have done has just fallen to shit. Yep. It's really interesting to watch. And it's like, well, the 49ers need a new head coach. The 49ers need a general manager. It's like, no, the 49ers need an exorcist. That's what they need. (laughs) But to your point, Randy, (laughs) To your point, they, the only way that they were going to get this thing passed is if they completely threw the election, did an old school mafia style, and it didn't work. They had to go to Santa Clara. And now they're ripping off the city of Santa Clara. Yeah. Isn't that what all this is about now? Like the teams just, if, the, if the, they can't manipulate the city into building them a huge new fancy stadium, they just go somewhere else and go somewhere else. And um, it, it, it's Well, the really other gross. thing about it. It's really gross. The other thing about it is the average American cannot afford a soiree to a football game anymore. It's ex- it's exorbitant. And if they cut out if they cut out the white middle class from going to these football games, yeah, because these are the ticket holders, yep. and a lot of them, you know, they're what do you call it? They're generational, and they pass the tickets, you know, the yeah. seat license and the ticket on to the next generation. And if these people pack up and go, there's not going to be anybody to take their place. I guarantee you. Well, you know, when I was a kid, my grandfather took me to Phillies games. 
I admit it's been a tough stretch if you're a Phillies fan, okay? <laughs> but today, that's not really even financially feasible for a middle class family to and do. Baseball's that. the cheapest sport to go attend. It's a, it is still the close. It's cheapest. super expensive. I go to yeah. the I go to the game a couple times a year with my dad and his girlfriend, and by the time it, the whole thing is done, you know, paying for parking, uh, the tickets, having something to eat and drink when you're there, it's probably five hundred bucks. Yeah, I would have guessed it's around two hundred bucks per person. Pretty, pretty close. Yeah. you know what I mean. Um, yeah, five hundred. That's bucks just not year. affordable for average Americans. Well, that's, the one thing about baseball that's cool, other like unlike other sports, you can bring your own food into a baseball. That's game. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which I've done. And so yeah. baseball is kind of chill. I like it for that. You can you can go and get bleacher seats for about fifteen bucks. Bring your own food in. Save about twenty bucks for your kids, you know, a little tchotchke or whatever, and then yeah. you're out of there. I mean, yeah, it's, it's you know, football is a whole different story. It's yeah. incredibly expensive. To, and basketball too is expensive. Oh, basketball is ridiculous. Ridiculous. I mean, yeah, you, you, I mean, it's almost impossible to get tickets to games sometimes. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, it's true. It's true. Um, so just to bring this back to astrology, you know, this is Uranus and Aries, Chiron and Aries. And football is an every sport. So we're going, to, we're going to see within the next decade a drastic reduction uh, in the NFL. You're, you're already seeing less, less kids play football yeah. as a sport. The numbers yeah. are down for kids because yes. of the CTE. And the NFL was really on the hook for the CTE stuff. And what happened was is that there are two things that took place. One – is that the the money for the Department of the Defense funneling into the NFL, making them be you know all you can be and be able to support the Army, make their players stand up for the national anthem, all well, that ran out. They're no longer getting that, and coupled with what was going on in the Obama administration, which was beginning to kind of infiltrate American sports on a number of different levels, football being one of them. And then being able to turn football from kind of what, what it was as an American male identitarian sport to now this kind of platform for social justice. That all took place even before Trump was in office. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. All right. Have we gotten yeah. through what we needed to get through? I think, we've, I, I, think, I think we did. Is there anything? I mean, uh, we may do a little uh, bonus segment with Robert for the, yeah. uh, for the, for the, the patrons. Um, but I think we've hit on all Am the I points. I cut that Patreon money for my bonus segment. <laughs> I'm get like 25 cents out of that. Cut, it, cut, it, cut him in. Cut him in. Yeah. I'll send you a quarter. There you go. The, the you one, go. the one, the one I crossed the desert looking for. You know. Hey, no, <laughs> well, you guys deserve every every penny you get. So I'm happy to contribute my time to them. Um, so anything else you want to say before we go, Robert? Uh, oh, I'll yeah, give, yeah, yeah, yeah. One more thing. Give, give people your, your website and your, uh, you know, all that stuff so people can yeah, go. So, yeah, uh, I'm doing a Patreon thing as well. No, I'm just oh. kidding. No, oh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you want. So my website is robertphoenix.com. You can Everybody get a, get a reading from Robert. Robert gave me, I've gotten a couple of readings from Robert, but I got one from him like just before the summer, like late spring, that was just phenomenal. At the time, I didn't understand in which ways it would be phenomenal, but everything that he said would happen has happened in a way that I would never have thought it to. Um, and it's actually been helpful to sort of understand things as they've been going on. So everybody go get a reading from Robert, man. They're super yes, cool. Please, please get a reading from me. My ex-wife would really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, the, the, only other, so the, only, the only other thing I wanted to talk about. The beleaguered American male at his finest. Me, <laughs> I'm okay with it, though. I've faced my shadow. I've consumed my inner cuck. <laughs> it's all over now. Do you want to hear the last line of this? I, I'm sorry, I'm obsessing on this. The Tom Petty song. The Tom Petty song. I scrolled down the screen because I was looking this up. I didn't know it by... The last line of the song says, waiting for the sun to be split over there. I ain't got any shadow at all. That's it. Whoa. Hello, Eclipse. That's yeah. exactly right. Hello, 
eclipse. God, yeah. God bless you, Tom Petty. Yeah. yeah, speaking from the grave, brother. Man. Wow. Okay, Maybe what was I, that? I got one more thing to share. Can I, can right. I share it? Sure. I wanted to just talk about this. We've got Jupiter going into Scorpio real soon, like next week, at the end of next week. It's moving into Scorpio. It's going to be there for a year. Jupiter expands everything, right? And Scorpio is sex and power and drugs. Get ready for a year where people check the fuck out. Oh. That's coming. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Get ready for the Weimar Republic of 2018. All right. <laughs> okay. Now, there's also some good things, resources, psychic abilities. You know, those things can be on tap. There's like levels of Scorpio. Yeah. A lower level and a higher level. And I think we're going to see both. But a lot of the lower level is going to be on tap because I think people are just going to be spent and out of it. And they just want to have some kind of distraction, dispersion, whatever that is. Yeah. In a big well, way. I mean, for, for, for the three of us and for our whole community of which we share a lot, I'm hoping for resources and psychic abilities for absolutely. us. Absolutely. Right, and yeah. transformation because Scorpio is transformation. transformation. Yeah. But, you know, but you got to get there, right? You got to, you know, you got to do the work. Martha, you got to get through it to get to the, uh, trying to be yeah, you got to do the work. It's hard. I, I, I'm totally in it right now. It's hard, but it, it, it's available. You're right. It's, av it's available. I'm recording. So this is breaking. Okay. Um, so there were also shots fired at the Aria Hotel in Caesars around the same time as the Mandalay mm -hmm. shooting. I heard Bellagio too. Well, there's more. Why aren't we hearing about that? Maybe because it doesn't follow the single shooter theory. Something's not adding up. Update. More facts are coming out. The OP of the casino pick has contacted me and asked me to link his comment on this post so there's more hold on this just came in there's chatter on the internet uh claiming paddock might have been involved in illegal arms trafficking maybe his living from gambling and therefore has a credible excuse to handle large random amounts of money he had a private pilot's license and used to work yeah. for yeah maybe he was a spook and maybe it was a fast and furious type smuggling deal um that's one here's another uh, check out the lyrics to the song 32nd Floor by the House of Love. So you guys can look at that if you want to. I told you, thirty. I think it was the 32nd Floor, yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. Uh, this is another one. Ms. Miller said the man sprinted through her hotel after coming off an escalator from the Mandalay Bay. The man that they, security, were chasing was wearing a security jacket like them, she said. Here's another one. Wendy Miller from Kubroy on the Sunshine Coast. So that's another Miller. There was two. You had a Mrs. Miller and a Wendy Miller. Okay, yeah. go on. She was also caught up in the attack. She was at the bar at the nearby Luxor Hotel mm. with her husband when she saw what she described as a man of interest run by. We managed to make our way back to our room, she told the courier mail. We are in Lockdale. Our door is deadlocked in a chair against the door. Ms. Miller said the man sprinted. There we go. There's, hold on. There's one more here. Let's find this. This was uh, Australian Brian Hodge, who previously worked at Jupiter's Casino on the Gold Coast, claimed he was staying in the room next to the shooter on level 32 at the Las Vegas Resort. He said he managed to escape the initial horrific scenes inside the hotel, but found himself forced to hide in a bush for several hours after the event. I got outside safely and was hiding in the bushes, Mr. Hodge said. There were multiple people dead and multiple shooters. I was just hiding, waiting for the police to come. There we wow. go. Well, I think we got one more here. Let's see what's this. Uh, this is from a woman. Paris Casino had active shooting as well. I work there. I don't understand why they're not saying the truth. I literally run for my life, just got home. Another well, person, yeah. I want the media report the other hotels. So I, heard there, was, not just I heard there was a shooter in Bellagio, too, yeah. So there's something big that went on that night. Yeah. And they want everybody's attention to be just drawn to one thing. So That's right. Wow. Okay. Well, right. here we go. Hit the stop on that. Um, All right. Let me be your bonus. Let me be your bonus burger. All right. So okay. let's, just, let's just end let's, the regular let's show. Exit, let's exit regular yeah. show. That's going to wrap it up. 
That's going to wrap it up for this time for all of you who are getting the public side of this. If you want to see more, hear more, learn more, and read more, catch us on patreon.com slash offplanetmedia. And uh, up for us. We're up for you. We'll be back again with another show real soon. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Go find it. Don't, 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 don't,